Welcome back, America. So we've had a good chance to talk to state officials who are leading the effort to change state laws and to go to court and challenge education policies that expose our young people to vulgar realities rather than enhance their experience in, in obtaining a quality education. Our next guest is the founder and president of an organization working to reclaim schools from activists. Her group has led investigations like when it found a $1 million contribution to Fairfax County Public Schools' top STEM academy from the Chinese. And they also educate parents on vocabulary that's on issues like gender ideology, an idea that was never even thought of just a decade ago. Nicole Neely of Parents Defending Education joins us now. Nicole, great to have you back on the show. Thanks for having me. You have been leading a grassroots movement in the courts and before school boards. A lot of extraordinary actions are going on. Uh, we've been talking to some state officials who passed their parental bill of rights. How do these legislation packages help parents begin to have autonomy over their children's education again? Isn't it sad that we have to get to the point where we just need to remind our elected officials of what their obligations are under the law? Um, but that is exactly what it does. It just, again, it reiterates, it reminds school officials, state officials, that parental rights are fundamental and that if you violate them, if you try and enact policies or laws that, that undermine that, then there will be consequences. Yeah. And the Supreme Court is unambiguous, right? There's not any doubt the parents has a supreme, supreme superior right to educate the children, the, their children the way they want, right? Absolutely. Across the board, parents have a right to direct the upbringing of their children on medical care, on issues of values. Um, and so, yeah, this is very clearly established over the past 100 years. Um, yeah, anything from in, in uh, Pennsylvania many years ago, there was a school district that tried to, um, they gave a student a pregnancy test um, because right. they thought that she was pregnant. Um, they took that to court and that family won. Um, there were, you know, so families that, where students didn't want to say the Pledge of Allegiance, again, because it, it contradicted their values. And so this is something that we shouldn't have to be litigating over, but we will, and at the end of the day, we will win. Yeah, the law is clearly on the side of parents. Uh, you've brought a lot of litigation uh, over the last few months to some really disturbing trend patterns, such as separating students by race. Tell us a little bit about some of the successes and some of the lawsuits you've brought in recent weeks. Sure. We currently have a case, a case that's up at the Eighth Circuit. Um, this is a case over those gender plans that you discussed earlier. Um, this is a district that has um, a uh, what we call a parental exclusion policy, where students um, beginning in seventh grade on, their decision whether to involve a family, their parents, into knowing what, what their gender identity is at school, um, the student's decision takes priority. Uh, and we think that that's, that's wrong. Um, and it's certainly being guided by school officials. Um, so we've challenged that both on 14th Amendment grounds as well as on First Amendment grounds, because if students decide that they don't want to use their peers' preferred pronoun, it's considered bullying and students can be subject to discipline up to and including expulsion. Um, we have also been filing dozens of civil rights complaints with the U.S. Department of Education across the country for separating students on the basis of skin color. That's called segregation. That was not okay in the 1950s, and it's certainly not okay in 2023. It's appalling that schools consider that acceptable pedagogy, but we will call them out on it. And as we've been filing these complaints, somewhat surprisingly, the Biden Department of Education has been opening investigations into these problems. And so we are cautiously optimistic that they will say, you know what, guys, you can't do this. So stay tuned. Absolutely. We'll be watching those uh, lawsuits very closely. Uh, one of the things that has come up repeatedly and really uh, concerned parents nationwide is the over-sexualization of children in these schools by teachers, by educators. You mentioned the gender counseling. I want to show you this clip of a boy who went to a school board meeting and showed the school board what graphic book he was given at the library. Let's watch this. I'm going to get your reaction to it. I'm a sixth grader. I was in the library and this book was on a stand. I'd like to read you a page my back over my hips as I ask if we should take off, take our clothes off. And he's saying yes before I finish my sentence. He's pulling off my t-shirt, laughing when I can't undo his shirt buttons. Now this book was at my middle school and it was on a stand. When I rented it out to show my dad it, uh, the librarian asked if I wanted more and if I wanted a graphic novel version. It's such a shocking thing to see that young man have to tell the school board how inappropriate this. This is a big issue, right? Libraries putting out really inappropriate materials to school children. Absolutely. Parents are horrified because they don't know what's taking place. And I think it's that secrecy. It's the these school administrators think they know better about how to raise our children, what our values should be for those of us who maybe decide we don't want our children exposed to graphic sexual material. You know, we're somehow wrong. We're shamed for those decisions. But I think it's really appalling that this is being done 
by school officials, school administrators, teachers, with our tax dollars behind our back. Um, why are they so determined to rip our children's innocence away? Let's look at some of these educational scores that came out this past fall. Yeah. Children's academic achievement has fallen off a cliff. And frankly, even before the pandemic was nothing to write home about. So children are unable to read or write at grade level. Yet instead we have schools that are doing this instead with the finite time they have with our children. Let's get back to the basics and let's get all this garbage out. Why are we distracting children from the, the purpose of being there, which is to learn? Yeah, and one of the great uh, uh, signs of a good government is transparency, right? We, we, the government shouldn't be afraid to do what it's doing with tax dollars. You found your reorganization had a remarkable report. 6,000 schools have rules that require faculty and staff to hide information from parents about their kids struggling with gender identity. How disturbing is this that they actually have rules in place to keep the parent out of the loop? Right, where they deliberately will say that, you know, families don't have a right to know this information. They will say, okay, well, they'll ask students on their gender support plan, is this, how should we refer to you when we call home, when we speak to your parents? So they are deliberately encouraging students to lead double lives. We identified 168 districts across the country, as you said, about 6,000 schools, covering over 3.2 million children. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. These are just the ones we know about. What I thought was really interesting is that a lot of this was taking place in red states. This is not just happening in California and New York. It was in Idaho. It's in you know, Oklahoma. It's in places where you really wouldn't think this is what's going on. And in some cases, these policies are being driven by state school board associations. The Idaho School Board Association was one that had been giving model policies to all these school boards. And so we remind parents, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. Keep an eye out. And if you see a policy in your district, pass it on to us so that we can add it to our list and notify other people in your district. Because almost certainly families have no idea that this is how their school feels about them. Uh, the price of liberty, liberty is eternal vigilance. That is a line I'm gonna remember for a long time, Nicole. Such an important reminder to all of us. I think we got complacent for a long time. The pandemic woke up parents to, what, hey, we gotta check and see what our teachers are doing. Now you have something really fun. Parents Defending Education has an indoctrination map on its website to show how close to home these issues are hitting. Tell us a little bit about that map. Sure, we have a tip line. And so we, uh, as people send us things that are going on in their backyard, we ask them to send us back a hyperlink, a PDF, what their children's assignments are. Um, they can check if they wanna be anonymous. Frighteningly, almost 100% of people say they do because they fear retaliation. But we believe that um, you know democracy dies in <clears throat> darkness. Um, and so once we can out some of these problems, if families know what's taking place in their backyard, it gives them a reason to show up at that school board. It gives them a reason to talk to their principal or teacher and say, I'm not comfortable with this. I don't really want you doing these things. And it also gives state legislators and federal legislators a reason to say, you know what? I don't really like that this is how, how our tax dollars are being spent. And so we hope it spurs people to action and also raises awareness about the problems that are facing our country. Yeah, so important. Nicole, we got about a minute left. I want to ask this. There are, we, earlier in the show, we, had, we highlighted several things that are going on in states, including a parents' rights law, even in the Congress. How can parents get, get behind legislatures and make sure they succeed in codifying things that maybe 10 years ago we thought we would never need to codify? How can parents as a grassroots army really make a difference and push these things over the line? Well, certainly we encourage everybody to reach out and contact their elected officials at any level and just remind them how they feel about these issues. Um, again, I think the pandemic really showed people where you live matters, right? I mean, quality of life in California that was masking up until very recently versus Florida is, is astonishing. And so let your elected officials know how you feel about these issues, because at the end of the day, they work for you. You're not there you know, at their whim. Um, and, and you certainly have a constitutional right to petition your government for a redress of grievances. So I want my rights protected. I don't want secrets kept from me. I don't want my tax dollars spent on different issues. Um, let your voice uh, be heard because it's really important. And there is strength in numbers. Yeah, there, there clearly is. And we're seeing that from 2021 on, from Virginia on forward, strength in numbers have made a big difference. And you've been right at the forefront of that, Nicole, doing a lot of hard work to make our children safe for the future. A greatly honored to have you on the show and greatly appreciate all the things you do. Thank you. All right, folks, we're going to take a quick commercial break and we'll be right back after these messages.